Charlie there. There's quite a lot of talk these days about fermented feed for chickens. Maybe you've read or heard something about it. It sounds really simple. You just take some feed, add it to some water and let it ferment and then feed it to your chickens and reap all kinds of benefits. I'd not really investigated or found out much about it or tried it, so I thought it was about time I gave it a go. I did a bit of experimenting and some investigation and once I started to find out a bit more about it, I found out all kinds of other interesting stuff. So although some of it's a little bit off topic, I hope you'll enjoy finding out all kinds of interesting things along with me. First of all, what should I ferment? I usually feed my hens layer pellets, which are a commercial chicken feed designed to meet all the nutritional requirements of laying hens. And I believe that should make up most of a hen's diet. But it's more common to ferment whole or cracked grains or seeds, such as wheat, barley, maize, oats, buckwheat, rye, sunflower or pumpkin seeds, bird seed mix, flax seeds, lentils, mung beans, quinoa. Some people also add all kinds of other chicken feed stuff such as fish meal, flax oil, clover, dandelion leaves, comfrey, lucerne, chicory, fruit except for citrus, cooked rice and vegetables except for onions. It's also possible to ferment commercial poultry pellets or mash but these of course are going to soften into a porridge-like consistency during the fermenting process with lots of water in it. So there's plenty of options, but when I decided to try out fermenting feed for the first time, I thought I'd try some whole grains. I happen to have a small amount of this mixed grain designed for fodder or cover crops. It's a mixture of wheat, barley and oats, so that sounded pretty good for my first attempt. Okay, so I have to mix it with water. Apparently, it's pretty important not to use chlorinated water, or the chlorine in the water will kill off the very bugs that we want to create the fermentation. Here in town, our water supply is chlorinated. It's possible to remove chlorine from water. There are several ways to do it. The simplest is just to let the water sit for a while. Chlorine is a gas at room temperature and in water it's a volatile solute which means its molecules are diffused in water and will escape into the air over time. The length of time this takes depends on the surface area of the air to which the water is exposed. So the process will be quicker in a wide shallow container than it is in a narrow deep one. And it will go faster if you stir or bubble air through the water. The evaporation rate also depends on temperature. So heating the water speeds up the process. If you boil the water, the chlorines will be gone in 15 minutes. But the major disadvantage with the evaporation method is that it removes only chlorine. And many modern water treatment systems use chloroamines. If you want to use your town supply water, you need to find out whether they just use chlorine or also chloroamines. You can filter out both chlorine and chloroamines using an activated carbon filter, sometimes known as a charcoal filter. This is a simple system and you might have one for your drinking water. The chlorine, chloroamine and organic compounds adhere to the carbon. Not having a carbon filter to hand and being impatient to get started, I dipped some water out of our rainwater tank. We just collect this water for use in the garden and lately we've had quite a bit of rain so the water in the tank looked pretty fresh and it certainly wasn't chlorinated. Right, something to mix it in. There are a couple of cautions about what kind of container you should use for your fermented feed. As the feed ferments it starts to get quite acid and that can corrode any metal so if you use a metal container you want it to be a high quality stainless steel and if you use plastic it should be BPA free so that made me wonder what is BPA 
BPA stands for bisphenol A. It's been used since the 1960s in the manufacture of polycarbonate plastics. In fact, 90% of the mass of polycarbonate is actually BPA. It's also used in the epoxy resins that coat the inside of the can for canned foods. The BPA can leach into the food, especially if the food is heated inside the container. And there are concerns about possible detrimental effects to human health, most notably reproductive health and neonatal development. But BPA is used because it makes the plastic or resin strong, resilient and durable. Without it or something similar, the plastic container simply couldn't do its job. So, in response to concerns about BPA, manufacturers have developed BPA-free plastics using alternatives such as BPS, bisphenol S, and BPF, bisphenol F. But as you might guess from their name, these can also leach into food and might also cause health problems. None of which is to say that fermenting chicken feed in a plastic container is going to kill your chickens. But maybe it's wise to use a food grade plastic. Anyway, I wanted to see what was going on with the feed as it fermented. So I used this glass container. How much water do I need? The sources that I read said that the water should always be above the top of the grain. So I wasn't really sure how much that would be. I started out with a little bit more water than grain. Later I had to add a bit more water. So if you want to get it mostly right to begin with, it's probably about twice the amount of water to the grain. Okay, mix it together. I didn't want dust or insects or airborne mold spores to fall into the feed as it was fermenting, so I covered it loosely with a cover. And then it needs to sit. What's supposed to be happening now is lacto-fermentation. Lacto-fermentation is the conversion of carbohydrates to lactic acid by microorganisms called lactic acid bacteria, known to their friends as LAB. There's also a New Zealand reggae band called LAB. beside the point. I found it fascinating to learn all about lacto-fermentation, but if you find the science a little bit boring, then you can skip straight to the chicken stuff around about here. Or if you want to go right to the conclusions at the end of my experiments, then you can go almost all the way to the end. But then you'd miss some really fascinating stuff about lactic acid bacteria. LAB are a loose collection of microorganisms of many different kinds. The most famous is Lactobacillus, Lactococcus and Bifidobacterium, which used to be known as Lactobacillus bifidus before the microbiologist decided to reclassify them. LAB are very common all around us, so I'm expecting that they're probably already present on that grain, in the water and in the air. Lactic acid bacteria are facultative anaerobes, which is scientific shorthand for saying that they can survive in oxygen, but unlike humans and birds, they can also survive without oxygen. So down below water level in the jar, the LAB are quite happy to work away at their fermentation, away from the oxygen in the air. As they do their work, they produce lactic acid. It's right there in the name. 
and lactic acid is of course an acid. So over time the contents of the jar get more and more acidic. And that suits the LAB very well. They like the acid, whereas many microorganisms that cause spoilage and rot can't survive in their very acid environment. That's the original purpose of making sauerkraut or pickles or turning fresh milk into yogurt. Milk would spoil, but lactofermentation makes the yogurt too acidic for the spoilage bacteria. Some LAB also produce carbon dioxide during fermentation, which also helps to lower the pH and lowers the concentration of oxygen dissolved in the water. So the more the LAB grow, the more they make their own environment to be low in oxygen as well as very acidic, just how they like it, and just the kind of conditions where the spoilage microorganisms can't survive. The optimal temperature for the growth of LAB is between 15 and 30 degrees Celsius. That's about 60 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit but they're not really fussy about temperature and will grow at quite cool temperatures, although more slowly, and will also tolerate quite hot ones. So learning all that fascinating stuff about lactic acid bacteria has some relevance to fermenting chicken feed. Now I know that. I don't need to add anything else to my grain and water in the jar. There will already be lactic acid bacteria and other bacteria around on the grain and in the water and in the environment. If I keep the grain submerged in the water, the LAB will grow quite happily at the bottom of the jar away from the oxygen and the air. But the grain will be protected from spoilage and moulds that prefer the oxygen environment. And as the LAB ferment the feed, they make lactic acid, and so that makes the feed more and more acid, which makes my choice of a container more important. And although the LAB don't need the air, they do sometimes produce carbon dioxide, and so that's important that I don't seal off the lid of the container, or I just might have an explosion. Some people say to stir the feed several times a day and other people say it doesn't need stirring at all. I thought about it logically and if the LAB actually prefer that low oxygen environment, it's probably best to leave them undisturbed to get on with their job at the bottom of the container. So I let my jar of grain and water sit in the corner of the bench in the shed to let those LAB get to work. It's summertime with warm days and nights, but nothing too extreme because we have a pretty mild temperate climate here. So why should I be bothering with this? Fermented feed enthusiasts quote many benefits for you and your chickens. They can be summarized into these main seven categories. Fermenting feed improves the digestion of the feed. It makes the feed more nutritious. It fights infection or illness from salmonella or other harmful bacteria. It improves egg productivity. You get more eggs per hen, bigger eggs with thicker, stronger shells, more eggs in winter and tastier eggs. They're supposed to be less poop. The chicken droppings are said to be drier and so easier to clean up. And there are claims that fermenting feed will lower your feed cost because the chickens eat less. There are claims of up to 20% less feed, they eat half the amount, or it doubles your feed content. And there will be less wastage of feed. So, do any of these claims stack up? Which ones can be verified? There's quite a lot of research recently about fermented feed for chickens. Most of it is targeted against meat birds, but some of it includes research into fermented feed for layer hens. Let's dive into the science. Does fermented feed improve the digestion of the feed? Before food can be digested, it needs to be ground into smaller pieces in the chicken's gizzard. 
the softer consistency of the fermented grains obviously makes it easier to grind up. But chickens have gizzards and eat grit precisely so they can digest these hard bits of food. Giving them softer feed is a bit like us eating liquids only. It might be useful in some circumstances, but most of the time it's not necessary if we've got good teeth. The rate at which nutrients can be absorbed depends on the integrity and surface area of the intestine. The internal wall of the intestine has many tiny projections called villi, which effectively increase the surface area. The presence of LAB increases the height of these villi in the intestine of laying hens. That does indicate an improvement in the health of the chicken's digestive systems. Large starch molecules in the feed are actually digested by the lactic acid bacteria rather than the chicken's digestive system. And then the products of the bacterial digestion, which are smaller molecules such as glucose, dextrin, lactic acid and monosaccharides, are absorbed by the chicken. Fermenting is making some nutrients more bioavailable to the chickens. However, some other essential amino acids, that's protein building blocks that are essential in a chicken's diet, some of them such as lysine and methionine are actually reduced after fermentation. So it's not all one way. So fermented feed does make some nutrients more bioavailable and it can help the chicken keep a healthy digestive system. What about nutrition? Seeds and grains often have substances called anti-nutritional factors or ANF. Examples are oligosaccharides in soybean meal, polysaccharides in corn and phytic acid in wheat. The plant uses these to make sure that the seed can get through an animal's digestive system and still be capable of germinating and growing after the seed is pooped out. Anti-nutritional factors are therefore great for the plant, but not so great for the animal wanting to digest that seed. LAB can destroy these anti-nutritional factors, so the chicken can get more nutrition from the feed. Many studies primarily targeted towards human nutrition have proved that LAB can actually synthesize a variety of water-soluble vitamins, including many of the B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, B6, B9 and B12. LAB also make vitamin C and vitamin K and a substance that was previously called vitamin B11 or terylheptaglutamic acid or chick growth factor but it's now not considered a distinct vitamin on its own but rather a derivative of folic acid but anyway LAB can just create it. So as the LAB are fermenting feed they are actually creating some vitamins that might be important if you bought a bulk of feed and it was now getting a little bit old as you stored it and the vitamin content was decreasing. Fermenting it can renew some of those vitamins. What about disease resistance? An early Dutch study showed that broiler chickens fed fermented feed were better able to rid their bodies of salmonella. Some of this disease resistance is probably due to the fact that a healthy intestine with lots of long villi, plus the acid itself, function as a physical barrier to infection by harmful bacteria like Salmonella, E. coli and Campylobacter. In addition, certain LAB have been proved to enhance the humoral immune system. That's the immunity that uses antibodies. The presence of LAB in the fermented feed enhances the T and B lymphocytes of the chicken's immune system and their blood antibody levels and so provides protection against viruses as well as pathogenic bacteria. So having a healthy microbiome that includes lactic acid bacteria can indeed help the chicken's general health 
and resistance to disease. And if you've had to treat your chickens with antibiotics recently, then fermented feed with lactic acid bacteria can help reinstate that healthy microbiome. What about the claim that fermented feed will give us more or better eggs? Contrary to what you might be hoping, a couple of studies have shown that layer pullets fed fermented feed actually take about 10 days longer to come into lay. There are mixed results about whether the eggs are bigger or smaller, sometimes within the same study, and inconclusive findings about the number of eggs per chicken, but none of the differences are very large. The eggshells of chickens on fermented feed do seem to be thicker and stronger. And as for tastier eggs? Well, a 2021 study found that fermented rapeseed cake improved the score in a sensory evaluation that included yolk colour, smell, texture and taste as compared to eggs from hens fed unfermented rapeseed cake. It is well proven that what chickens eat has an effect on the chemical and nutrient composition of the egg, white and yolk. But to be honest, these effects are so small that you'd have to have a very well-developed palate to notice the difference. So I'll leave that up to you or whoever it is that eats the eggs from your chickens. Will there be less poop to clean up? There's not a lot of published research about chicken poop. But a Danish researcher, Ricarda Engberg, has been working on the effects of fermented feed for chickens for over 10 years. One of her early studies noted that the chickens fed fermented feed did produce less poop. This could be because they were eating a little less feed as well as digesting more of what they ate. However, as to drier poop and easier cleanup, that seems to be debatable. Most researchers have found that the droppings are actually more liquid with the fermented feed. What about saving money? That's important to most people. Studies do suggest that chickens might eat a little less fermented feed, but this is not a huge difference. 110 grams per day of dry weight of feed that was fermented compared to 125 grams of unfermented. So that's about a 10% saving, certainly nothing like halving the amount of feed your chickens eat. Maybe there's also a possibility that you could feed cheaper feed because the chickens digest more protein and therefore get more out of a cheaper fermented feed than they would out of a more expensive dry feed. This was actually the point of the 2021 study about rapeseed cake. Could fermented rapeseed feed be as good as the usual soy-based feed? And yes, the conclusion was that it could. But fermentation doesn't create minerals or proteins or calories. The quality of the fermented feed does depend on what goes into the jar. But there's one potential savings that most people overlook. Depending on your circumstances, fermenting chicken feed can reduce feed wastage. If you're currently feeding a mixture of whole or cracked grains, then the chickens are inclined to sort through it and pick out their favorite morsels and toss aside the ones that they don't prefer quite so much. If you ferment the feed, it's more likely to be one even consistency and the chickens will eat it all. As well as reducing wasted feed, this means that chickens lower in the pecking order get the same mixture of feed that those higher up the pecking order that get first dibs do. All of the chickens are eating all of the components of feed, including any vitamins or minerals that might have been added into the feed mixture. This doesn't apply if you're feeding your chickens mash or pellets because all of the pellets are exactly the same and the consistency with all of the components of the feed is the same right throughout the pellets. But there is one aspect of wastage of pellets that fermenting your feed can make a difference. Fermenting your feed does seem like a good way to get good value out of that powdery stuff 
that's often left at the bottom of the bag of pellets. Chickens tend to pick out the pellets and avoid eating the fine, dusty stuff. Maybe adding that powdery stuff to a fermented mix would work out well, although I haven't tried it. You could also simply soak that powdery stuff into a wet mash, which chickens like. Or you could do like I do, and use the fine grainy stuff as food for mealworms, which chickens definitely do love to eat. So what happened with my first experiment of fermented feed for chickens? I must say, to start with, it wasn't very dramatic. The wet grains just kind of soaked in the water for a day, then two days, and then three. The feed didn't look very different, except that it developed a thin white layer on top of the water. With a bit of investigation, I decided this was calm yeast. Calm yeast is a yeast that grows aerobically, that is, on the surface, using the oxygen from the air in an acid environment. It doesn't spoil the fermented feed like a mould would, and it does show that the LAB have been growing and have produced enough lactic acid to make the liquid acid, so that's a good sign. Also, yeasts have a symbiotic relationship with LAB through processes called trophic interactions. So the calm yeast is actually helping the LAB and nothing to worry about. But anyway, I decided that three days was long enough. So I drained off the liquid and took the fermented feed out to my chickens. They were excited because I was coming and bringing them something in a little pottle. Then they were a bit disappointed that what I was bringing wasn't mealworms. They didn't seem to be too keen on this new taste. and pretty soon wandered off to do more interesting chicken things. But when I looked again half an hour later, someone had cleaned up all of the fermented feed. So someone liked it. So I did another batch. Again, grains, chlorine-free water, glass container, cover but not tightly, and leave in a warm place for one day, two days, and then three days. This time I didn't get so much calm yeast on top but it was quite clear that the LAB were fermenting the grain and producing bubbles. And this time, the taste was a little bit more familiar to the chickens, and they all seemed quite keen on it. 
during the week I continued to do a bit more research about fermented feed and there were a couple of points I hadn't noticed. One question is about what kind of microorganisms are colonising the ferment? Just relying on whatever microorganisms were already in the grain and in the environment meant you could end up with enormous number of possible microorganisms in the ferment, some of which would be the LABs that you want, some of which are unintended but harmless like the calm yeast, and others might have been unfavourable. It's worth being aware that the scientific literature about the results of fermenting feed work with particular defined and identified bacteria. When it comes to translating those findings into your bottle of ferment, results may vary. In order to have some control over the microorganisms that were in my second batch, I put a tiny bit of live yogurt in the mixture when I started to try and tilt the balance towards the LAB that I wanted. And I could see that the second batch produced more carbon dioxide in the form of bubbles than the first batch. Which does indicate that it probably was a slightly different mix of microorganisms. Was the fermentation that was going on just lacto-fermentation or was it also alcoholic fermentation from wild yeasts? In other words, the chickens preferred the second batch because it was actually beer? Without culturing and identifying the microorganisms in each batch, we really have no idea what kind of microorganisms are there in the jar. And what about that liquid that was drained off from the top of the fermented grains? Surely there were some nutrients and vitamins that were actually in that liquid. And I just threw it away. Some people use that liquid as a kind of starter for the next batch, a bit like you might use a starter for sourdough bread or the mother for cider vinegar. If you know you've got a really good mix of bacteria in your batch, that's probably a good idea. And I had time to read very thoroughly that 2009 paper by our Danish researcher, Dr. Engberg. One aspect of her findings that most people don't mention is that she found her chickens got more aggressive on a diet of fermented feed. Chickens started attacking each other and there was outbreaks of cannibalism. She also recorded that the chickens' feathers were in worse condition on fermented feed. I only found one other mention of feather condition after fermenting feed and that was a chicken keeper who posted on a chicken forum and said that after a month of feeding nothing but fermented feed, her chickens looked rather haggard. Poor chickens. And a warning about baby chicks. I did find a study that fed fermented feed to chicks in their first month of life. It stunted their growth. So fermented feed is not a good idea for baby chicks. So what's my conclusion about fermented feed for chickens? What are the take home messages? Fermented feed definitely does have some health benefits for chickens. It encourages a healthy microbiome, which is good for their general health, and their digestive and immune systems. Just like it's good for us to eat fermented food like kimchi and yogurt and other live foods. It's pretty easy to do, and it doesn't take a lot of complicated equipment. It does mean you've got to be a little bit organized and just ferment the amount of feed that you're going to need to feed each day a couple of days in advance. If you ferment the feed for too long, it gets more and more acid and less and less palatable to the chickens. Regardless of what you choose to ferment, even if it's your usual feed, I would suggest that you keep the fermented feed as just part of the chicken's treats and not their whole diet. That's because fermenting the feed does change the nutritional profile. 
Yes, it encourages more of some vitamins. It actually creates some of the B vitamins. As I said, that might be a good idea if your feed is getting a little bit old, but it also reduces some of the other nutrients. So uh, swings and roundabouts, it really shouldn't be the major part of their diet. Your chickens might not love it first time. Give them time to get used to it. And is it going to save you money? Well, probably not much. Maybe nothing at all, depending on what you choose to ferment. But at best, maybe 10%. Certainly nothing like 50% of your cost, as some fermented feed enthusiasts suggest. This has been a rather long and technical video, but I hope you found it interesting and you've learned some interesting things as I did. If you've tried fermented feed for your chickens, do leave me a comment about it. I'd love to hear how it went for you. Thank you and thanks for watching. Bye for now. See you next time. Thank you.